This Sunday, back from Europe. I did what I came to do. President Biden faces challenges here at home. A new Democratic compromise on voting rights. I'm heartened to see uh, the discussion moving forward. Gets a promised filibuster from Republicans. Equally unacceptable, totally inappropriate. All Republicans, I think, will oppose that. A bipartisan framework on infrastructure. I think it's encouraging that people are still talking. Could lose support from progressive Democrats. This is as clear as day. No climate, no deal. Can President Biden get his agenda through this closely divided Congress? My guests this morning, Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont and Senator Rob Portman of Ohio. Plus, after the summit. The tone of the entire meeting was good, positive. President Biden and Vladimir Putin take the measure of each other. This is not about trust. This is about self-interest and verification of self-interest. Putin deflects evidence of Russian cyber hacking, but both leaders say they hope for a better relationship. I'll talk to a Trump and Obama Russia advisor, Fiona Hill, about how we'll know whether this summit was a success. And for the third time, Obamacare survives a Supreme Court challenge. The Supreme Court has just ruled the ACA is here to stay. Signaling the likely end of the Republicans' decade-long efforts to kill it. Joining me for insight and analysis are Washington Post White House Bureau Chief Ashley Parker, Democratic pollster Cornell Belcher, PBS NewsHour Chief Correspondent Amna Nawaz, and Republican strategist Brad Todd. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. Good Sunday morning and a happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. After a largely successful week of meetings with foreign leaders in England, Belgium, and Switzerland, including the much-anticipated summit with Vladimir Putin, President Biden came home to find his domestic challenges waiting for him. And for every sign of hope for some progress, there is a flashing yellow light warning of disappointment. Yes, Joe Manchin released his counteroffer to protect voting access. But no, Republicans are certain to filibuster that. Yes, 21 senators, including 11 Republicans, have agreed on a bipartisan framework on infrastructure. But no, progressive Democrats are taking a dim view of the deal for now. Yes, Republican Senator Tim Scott says he's cautiously optimistic about passing a bipartisan police reform bill. But no, there is not a guarantee that this, like previous good news signs on police reform, will hold up. President Biden has been remarkably silent on these issues, but soon enough, He's going to have to decide how to move forward and where to exert presidential pressure on progressives, on the centrist Democrats, or on both. Because now that the overseas trip is in the rear view mirror, the road ahead is much more politics than it is Putin. After a whirlwind trip abroad, President Biden returns to high stakes political diplomacy at home. A test of how aggressively he will press members of his own party to spend their political capital to push his agenda through Congress. A bipartisan framework on infrastructure is gaining traction on Capitol Hill. Eleven Republicans now support it in the Senate, enough to clear the 60-vote hurdle if it doesn't lose Democratic votes. I know that my chief of staff thinks there's some room that there may be a means by which to get this done. But the deal is already being panned by progressives. This is as clear as day. No climate no deal. I continue to believe that most of what is being discussed in this effort would heap new taxes on working people. If a bipartisan deal sucks up trillions of dollars in bridges to nowhere to, because it makes people feel good, then that's going to be a huge concern. Then there's the problem of paying for it. Pay-fors in an early draft included raising the gas tax, something the White House has ruled out. Shall we say there's still issues? Democrats are crafting their own ambitious package, which they said this week could cost up to $6 trillion and include top progressive priorities, climate change provisions, money for elder care, and paid family leave, a Medicare expansion, and legal status for millions of undocumented immigrants. There's plenty of reasons to do a, a, another package, uh, but I think the key is, is how are we going to pay for it? And, uh, and, and how are we going to be able to get enough votes to do it? On voting rights, West Virginia's Joe Manchin, who had been a holdout on new legislation, extended an olive branch to progressives, backing a narrower alternative, making Election Day a holiday, requiring 15 days of early voting, 
and banning partisan gerrymandering, among other steps. And I've been working across the aisle with all the Republicans trying to get people to understand that that's the bedrock of our democracy, an accessible, fair, and basically secured voting. Key progressives endorsed Manchin's plan, surprising Republicans who hope to drive a wedge between Democrats on this issue. Is that a compromise you could support? Absolutely. What Senator Manchin is putting forward are some basic building blocks that we need to ensure that democracy is accessible no matter your geography. Republican leader Mitch McConnell vowed to block the compromise offer. Equally unacceptable, totally inappropriate. All Republicans, I think, will oppose that. And joining me now is Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont. He's, of course, the chair of the Senate Budget Committee. Senator Sanders, welcome back to Meet the Press and a happy Father's Day. Thank you very much. Happy Father's Day to you. Appreciate that. Look, uh, you said on Monday that you weren't going to support this bipartisan uh, infrastructure deal as it stands right now. What would it take for you to support this deal, um, particularly if President Biden starts to sign off on it? Um, what would it take, uh, even if you don't love it? Well, Chuck, look, what we have got to do in these budgets is address the crises facing the American people. It is true that our roads and our bridges and our water systems and our wastewater plants are crumbling and we need to invest in them. As I understand that the so-called bipartisan plan really only provides about 25 percent of the money that the president asked for, about $580 billion. But the point goes beyond that. The working people of this country understand, Chuck, that for decades we have ignored their needs while the very richest people in this country have become richer. So we have a situation right now where people throughout this country cannot afford child care. People cannot afford elderly people, cannot afford hearing aids or dental care. We have a disaster in terms of climate impacting this country right now? How do you go forward right now in this moment in history and not address the terrible climate crisis that we face and transform our energy system? How do you not deal with housing yeah. when 18 million families are spending 50 percent or more of their limited incomes on housing? And the list goes on and on. Rich get richer. Working people are struggling. It is time we paid attention to the needs of working people. And when we do that, when we deal with climate, when we deal with infrastructure, when we deal with home health care, when we deal with child care, we can create millions of good paying jobs. That is what the American people want. That's what we've got to do. Are you comfortable with a two step process where you do you, you, you noted this is the 25 percent uh, about of what of what President Biden asked for? Is it worth it in your mind to take what you can get in a bipartisan way, especially if that's the way you can get Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema to get on board a, a Democrats only bill that may tackle the care economy, as you just outlined? Well, look, as I said, what is in the bipartisan bill in terms of spending is from what I can see mostly good. It is roads and bridges, and we need to do that. That is what we are proposing in our legislation, but in much greater numbers. Uh, one of the concerns that I do have about the bipartisan bill is how they are going to pay uh, for their proposals. And, and they're not clear yet. I don't know that they even know yet, but some of the speculation is raising a gas tax, which yeah. I don't support, a fee on electric vehicles, privatization of infrastructure. Those are proposals that I would not support. Is, do you get the, at the end of the day, do you think this ends up passing as a, a, a by raising the deficit? Is that something you're comfortable with? And then Democrats have to go it alone and, and possibly raise taxes on their own? Is that where this is headed? Well, when you talk about taxes, let us also be clear. And I think the average American, whether you're Democrat, Republican or independent, understands there's something absurd that at a time of massive income, wealth and wealth inequality, when the very rich are becoming much richer, when two people own more wealth than the bottom 40 percent of America, that you have billionaires out there who pay zero, not a penny in federal income tax. Large, profitable corporations pay nothing in federal income tax. So what the president has said, he doesn't want to raise taxes on people making 400,000 or less. I agree with that. But you know what? In order to lower the cost of prescription drugs, 
in order to deal with paid family and medical leave because we're the only major country on earth that doesn't provide that. Yes, we are going to have to ask the wealthy and right. the powerful to start paying their fair share of taxes. I want to go back because uh, you kind of ducked the question the first time. Uh, would you support or at least vow not to kill the bipartisan deal if you got a commitment from the president and, the, and some of those centrist senators to support uh, a, a larger attempt to sort of a part two Democrats only reconciliation bill? Well, Chuck, I don't know that anybody could give you an honest answer for that because nobody really knows what is going to be in this bipartisan agreement uh, and how it is going to be paid for. So if it is roads and bridges, yeah, of course we need to do that, and I support that. If it is regressive taxation, gotcha. you know, raising the gas tax or a fee on electric vehicles or the privatization of infrastructure, no, I wouldn't support it. But we don't have the details right now. Let me ask you about Obamacare. The Supreme Court ruling this week, uh, I, this is the, the third one, and I even heard Republican senators say, okay, no more, no moss. They're not going to try to kill Obamacare anymore. Uh, you were a reluctant supporter of it. You wanted, you preferred something bigger, Medicare for all. Where is your priority now? Making Obamacare closer to your vision on Medicare for all, lowering, you know, doing things like that? Or do you still think in the future Obamacare should be scrapped and replaced? Well, it's not a, Obamacare has done a lot of good for a lot of people. That's, that's clearly the fact, and I support that. But at the end of the day, Chuck, we are the only major country on earth that doesn't guarantee health care to all people is right. We are spending roughly twice as much per capita on health care as do the people of any other country. And 90 million of us are uninsured or underinsured. We pay by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. We don't have enough doctors and nurses and dentists, especially in underserved rural areas. Mm -hmm. This is not a system that is working. We pay a fortune. We don't get good value. My own view is that we must move to a Medicare for all single payer program. And by the way, there is growing support yeah. to at least right now expand Medicare to cover dental, to cover hearing, right. to cover eyeglasses. It is outrageous that millions of seniors have trouble eating because they can't afford uh, dentures. Uh, and very quickly, there's a campaign uh, by some groups actually uh, that are very supportive of you uh, throughout the years that are calling on Justice Stephen Breyer to retire uh, among one campaign ad. It is time for Justice Stephen Breyer to announce his intent to retire from the Supreme Court. Do you think this camp pressure campaign is appropriate? And would you like to see him retire now? No, I, I will let the judge make his own decision. I'm not going to tell him what to do. Senator Bernie Sanders, uh, the independent progressive from Vermont, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your perspective on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, let's dive deeper into this bipartisan, potential bipartisan agreement. Joining me now is Republican Senator Rob Portman of Ohio. He's been uh, a lead negotiator in this bipartisan infrastructure talks. Uh, Senator Portman, welcome back to Meet the Press. So I got to ask first this before I get you to respond to, to Senator Sanders. Um, I, I, given what we heard from Senator Tester on Friday about the gas tax, I got to ask you, are all 20 of one of you still on board this deal uh, if you haven't agreed to how you're going to pay for it? Uh, yes. And in fact, we do have pay for us. Uh, I was interested in hearing from uh, my colleague, Senator Sanders. He said at one point with regard to the six trillion dollar package, the list goes on and on. And, and that's the problem. I mean, that, it's not about infrastructure. It's kind of a, a six trillion dollar grab bag of progressive priorities. Ours is about core infrastructure and it is paid for. And so it's paid for without raising taxes, which is key. And I do think we have agreement on that. And I do think there's some very creative ways to pay for infrastructure that wouldn't be available for other expenses. As an example, the infrastructure bank, which is a bipartisan proposal that says, let's use the power of the federal government to borrow at lower rates to be able to leverage private sector funding as well as state and local funding. But also we're repurposing COVID funding, Chuck, and over $100 billion in the proposal is repurposing in three ways funding that has not yet been spent with regard to the COVID-19 packages that have gone out, including the latest $350 billion package to state and local government, they would like to spend some of that on infrastructure. My state of Ohio certainly would, right. and we would permit them to do that, and that helps pay for the package. So there, there's some creative ways to pay for infrastructure. So the gas tax is out? Well, the administration has said that it's out for them. Uh, we don't have a gas tax per se. It is going forward indexing the gas tax to inflation. 
It's been the same since 1993, so the, the, the group does support that. But we understand that the administration has very strong views on that, so it's a, it's a user fee. We also think that the user fee on electric vehicles is appropriate. Shouldn't electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles yeah. pay their fair share in terms of our infrastructure and need roads and bridges? So I think there's some discussion uh, left on, on those topics. It, all right. Does, is that code for it, it, it may end up not being in the final package? Well, it, it may not, but the administration, uh, therefore, will need to come forward with some other ideas uh, without raising taxes. What we don't want to do is hurt the economy right now as we're coming out of this pandemic by raising taxes on working families. And that's, frankly, what's done in the, in the $6 trillion package. It's the largest tax increase in American history in addition to this huge spending. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's important that we have pay-fors, but we don't want to raise taxes. Well, let me ask you this, and this is, you know, why shouldn't either Jeff Bezos, the individual, or Amazon, the corporation, be contributing more to our infrastructure? Well, they, they should be paying taxes, and, and that's actually part of our proposal, too. We have about a $63 billion pay-for that is helping to close the tax gap. That assumes about a $40 billion investment in the IRS, including, by the way, in better taxpayer service, which is really important right now, but also in enforcement. And let's be sure that we're closing that tax gap. Uh, we don't want to do it in a way that's too intrusive in the lives of Americans or in small businesses. But I think that's a good uh, sweet spot, kind of a, a compromise. The administration talked about a $700 billion fund there. Uh, that really is, is not appropriate in our view, but there's a bipartisan agreement on help, helping to close that tax gap. Uh, I, I am curious, though. Um, it does seem as if all the pay-fors, you know, there's this big list, and yes, you called it creative ways. You know, the average person looks at it and says, eh, this is accounting maneuvers. This is only going to increase the deficit, and it seems like there seems to be comfort uh, that, okay, let the deficit go up uh, if it's for infrastructure. Is that where your head is? Is that where this is going to end up being? No, no, absolutely not. I, I, I would disagree there, Chuck. I, I think when you look at infrastructure, you have to think about what it is. It's long-term investments. Uh, as an example, we've got a bridge over the Ohio River in downtown Cincinnati, where I am, that, that has been in need of repair for a couple of decades now. It's about a $3 billion project. It's going to take a long time to do it, probably uh, five to ten years, and it's about a 50-year project, we hope. In other words, these hard, hard assets will last for, for many, many years. So you finance that differently, just as you would in your business or your, or your family. So this is supporting long-term investments to increase our productivity as a country, to increase our competitiveness. Right. All the economics of this uh, work well for uh, our long-term economic growth, and, and that's what this is about. So it's, it's something that can be paid for differently and has been traditionally. I mean, traditionally, we have allowed the federal government to provide relatively low-interest loans that get paid back and that's what we have in the proposal, the so-called infrastructure bank, which is a revolving loan program. Much is being done right now with regard to things like water infrastructure or the grid. Of course, the ratepayers themselves right. will, will, will pay that back. So it's, it, is, it is a way to pay for it, not going further into deficit, but understanding that these are long-term capital assets that we need to do. By the way, we don't get good marks on our infrastructure in this country, and we're, yeah. and we're losing out to other countries in terms of our competitiveness. So it's important to do it. There are many... Uh Democratic activists whispering in the White House's ear going, don't trust the Republicans. Mitch McConnell's going to pull the rug out from under them. And suddenly you think you have 11 Republicans uh, and then the deal dies or this is being dragged out. Um, how committed is this group of 11 Republicans to stick and buy this deal, even if Mitch McConnell says he can't vote for it? I think we're absolutely committed to it, and I think there's a number of others as well on both sides of the aisle. Uh, last week, I heard from a lot of my colleagues saying, I just need to look at one other issue. You know, can you do this? Can you do that? But uh, there's, there's a lot of interest in having a bipartisan proposal. And, Chuck, this is uh, growing the vote from the middle out. So yes. I, I think, unfortunately, that's where we are right now in Congress, is that it's, it's, it's more likely we'll have success in doing that. You recall at the end of last year, we did the same thing with regard to a COVID-19 package, which helped to get right. that final package done at the end of the year after really almost a year of, of no activity on something that was well, really necessary. This is the same thing. Right. Everybody wants to do infrastructure. President Trump had a $2 trillion package that he was proposing. President Biden proposed one in his campaign. And by the way, this helps President Biden keep that pledge of having an infrastructure package, but also to keep his pledge of doing things across the aisle and getting something done. Well, speaking of 
building something from the middle out. I want to ask you about Joe Manchin's idea on voting reform. He put out a blueprint and a memo, five bullet points. They look fairly reasonable. I'm curious what you think. Make Election Day a public holiday. Mandate at least 15 days of early voting. Ban partisan gerrymandering. Require states uh, send absentee ballots to eligible voters and require voter ID. Um, with uh, but including things like utility bills. Is that a basis to start a conversation in your view? Well, first of all, I appreciate what Joe Manchin is doing here. He's trying to find some middle ground. Uh, unfortunately, what he does is what the larger bill, S-1, does, which is it takes the election system in this country and federalizes it. So it's a federal takeover of our election system. And as you know, under the Constitution, the, the states are given takeover? that power. I, I, I don't, and you only know, in I extraordinary mean, circumstances. Yeah. Wait, only because well, there's yeah, usually because a baseline. It, it would be telling my, my state of Ohio right. that... Federal government tells no, the state he, how to he, spend transportation to states, money sometimes. Well, that, that, that's true, when there's, and there's federal money provided for that. In this case, what he's saying to the state of Ohio or your state of Florida, right. uh, we're going to decide how redistricting is done. We're going to take it away from the democracy in effect, which is right now in Ohio, you know, our state legislature makes that decision. These are elected representatives and he wants to take it away and make it a federal responsibility through some kind of a commission. But even provisional voting, I mean, he says that if you get a provisional vote outside of the precinct, uh, you know, you have to, you have to in include it. Well, that's a state rule, you know, that some states allow and some don't. Mm -hmm. So th the bottom line is we should make it easy to vote in this country. We should also make it hard to cheat. Uh, I'm proud of our Ohio election right. system. and I. I think they do a very good job, and it's based on a, you know, a bipartisan approach because we have okay. Democrats and Republicans at every election board in every county, and why take that away from, from the state of Ohio? So that's the concern about what Joe's trying to do, although, again, I appreciate he's trying to find that middle ground, and, and right. who knows, maybe something can be done. Senator Portman, happy Father's Day, sir. Appreciate you coming on and sharing your perspective. Happy Father's Day to you, Chuck. Thank Thanks you. for having me on again. Take care. You got it. Coming up, the Biden-Putin summit. Was it a success or was it a mistake? I'll talk to Fiona Hill a Russia expert and a former uh, uh, national security official under the Trump administration when we come back. Welcome back to Borrow Line from the Godfather. Last week's Biden-Putin summit wasn't personal. It was strictly business. It was less Joe and Vladimir than it was president to president, a brief no-frills meeting between two men who can neither trust nor verify, especially when it comes to Russia-based cyber attacks. So was it a success? Or was it a mistake? Joining me now is Fiona Hill, who was a top advisor to President Trump on Russia and who was uh, so alarmed by his behavior at that infamous Helsinki summit that she says she considered faking a medical emergency. And you may also remember Hill testifying during Mr. Trump's first impeachment. Uh, and she also briefed, helped brief President Biden before this trip. Dr. Hill, welcome to Meet the Press. Thanks so much, Chuck. So let me start with um, this. Um, Instead of trying to ask you to gauge, was it worth it? When will you decide whether this Geneva summit was worth it? What's the, what, what, what should we watch for to find out whether this summit was a good idea or not? Well, look, I think that's really the right approach, Chuck, looking forward. I think what we'll have to see is whether there are additional meetings at high level. You know, we've heard as we've come out of the summit that there have been some plans for having strategic stability talks. Those are the talks about how we're going to manage our respective nuclear arsenals. The Russians have got a lot of uh, new novel weapons that can sort of hit us in all kinds of unfortunate ways. The Russians themselves are extraordinarily concerned about some of our long range precision strike conventional weapons, and we have to find a way of talking about them. The old treaties that we've had in the past, the INF treaty we've pulled out of, the new START treaty, we've extended it for a short uh, period, but that has to be uh, basically renegotiated. And the whole nuclear world is much more complex than it was before because we've got China as an increasingly um, worrying nuclear power on the strategic side. But the main problem is really in cyber, which I think you were alluding to in the run up uh, to this discussion. And that's where we're going to have to see whether we're able to actually sit down and have some serious cyber talks, not just at the working level, but something that takes it up to try to reach some kind of agreement. So. Did we, uh, there's some concern that we may have given Putin a new status quo because he amassed troops to the border of Ukraine and he got this summit, so then he pulls them back, but he still got Crimea. We got him to agree apparently not to kill Navalny, but Navalny's still in prison. Uh, you know, did, did, did Putin get more out of this than we realized? 
Well, in terms of the symbolism of having a sit down with the American president, absolutely, that is a very important win for Putin. But it's not a win if nothing happens out of it. That is just an episodic event. And, you know, he can't take that to the bank for a long time and cash it in. He's got to basically present himself at home as the great statesman because he himself has to subject uh, his presidency to a, a re-election. I mean, we keep hearing he's going to stay out until 2036, but in 2024, he's got to have elections as well. He's got to show he's still popular. And in the meantime, coming up, there are parliamentary elections uh, for, for the Russian Duma. You know, so basically the ruling party, United Russia, also has to uh, subject itself to re-election and they're not looking very popular. And on the back of that, Putin actually has a big problem right now with COVID and the pandemic. So he's got a lot of problems on the domestic front. He's only got about 10% of the population vaccinated. He's spent all of this time being an anti-vaxxer, talking down all the vaccines, including AstraZeneca and Pfizer and Moderna. And now Russians don't want to have shots in their arms either. So Putin's got to figure out how to navigate things. And he can't just um, basically uh, live off uh, an episodic meeting with the United States president in Geneva for months to come. So he's got to show something out of it. And the problem with the previous administration, with President Trump for Vladimir Putin, is fantastic meetings from his perspective. He was able to push all of our political sure. buttons, make fun of us, humiliate us always have sit downs that he wanted to or telephone calls, but he never got any kinds of agreements. Right. And so that really, you know, wasn't all that worthwhile. So he has to get something out of this as well, something more than just the meeting in Geneva. What are we miscalculating on our ability to, to sort of punish uh, Putin or change his behavior? Because if I look back on the last decade, there's actually been a quite a, a bit of an array of attempts, whether it's embarrassing him at, uh, in front of the International Olympic Committee, the Panama Papers, uh, the various sanctions. It, it, it isn't if we haven't tried new things and haven't tried to do this, and it, none of it seems to, to work. Why? Well, look, you have to have a very clear red line and a very clear unified response. Some of our problem is our own inability to have collective action. And the previous segments this morning, you know, show part of that problem. We've got so much partisan infighting that we can't even agree on what should seem to be some simple things like an infrastructure bill for anybody who's riding around, you know, in their car anywhere in the United States. Filling potholes should be a, you know, a fairly simple thing to do. So it's the collective action. It's the fact that we can't get Congress uh, to work together on foreign affairs and national security as well as on domestic fronts. It's our inability sometimes to work with our allies because often we've been at odds with them. But the thing is, it does actually work. I'll give you one episode that did work with Russia. Mm -hmm. And it's not a very pleasant one. But everyone will recall in 2018, there was an incident in Syria. Our right. military was very clear to the Russian military, you fire on our guys, we'll fire back. So the Russians tried co covert subversive action by putting in some paramilitary forces, a militia, the Wagner Group. They shot at our guys pretending to be rebels. They got shot back at. And the Russians accepted that they'd overstretched uh, the right. mark, that they'd gone over the red line and that this was a massive mistake. That's the kind of action and response that we need to be able to set up. So we have to try to find that in cyber as well. We, it's no good telling the Russians what we're going to do and sure. reporting on it all the time. But what we have to do is make a clear red line and then have a response that they know why that response happened and that then they have to recalculate. Uh, you brought up the 2024 elections that Putin's got uh, happening and, and I guess the question is, what comes after Putin? And how soon do you think that post-Putin world begins? Well, it's a really good question, isn't it? When he said that he's going to stay until 2036, which will make him 84 years old, and he'll have been in power then for 36 years, having come in in uh, January of uh, 2020. So in some respects, there seems to be never anything <laughs> out of uh, beyond Putin in our lifetimes. Uh, what um, he's signaling, however, is that he wants to make the decision about who is the next president, just as he did when he stepped down for a brief period and put Dmitry Medvedev in place um, as president for a four year period. He certainly doesn't want Alexei Navalny to become president, although Navalny's made it clear he wants to be and has been incredibly brave in returning to Russia, only, of right. course, to be uh, put into jail. What Putin wants to do is choose someone 
probably one of his protégés, a younger version of himself, perhaps from the security forces or somebody else that he's installed in one of the regional um, governors, for example, or somebody else from uh, the inner circle. So he has to show that he is in complete control to make that happen. What he's trying to do, of course, is to stifle right. the choice, the democratic choice of the Russian people to decide for themselves. So what comes after him could very well be another Putin uh, mm -hmm. in some respects, but perhaps somebody from a different background, not somebody from the um, old KGB, uh, the FSB. So we might, you know, see something a little different, but he's trying to just say it's more of right. the same of him to protect himself and all of those around him. Well, you sound like you've described a little bit of what we just saw in Iran, where essentially the leaders are picking who gets to be on the ballot to be the leader anyway. Fiona Hill, uh, it's exactly. great to have uh, your perspective on here. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Happy Father's Day. Thank you very much. And when we come back, do Republicans want to make deals with Democrats or do they want to deny President Biden any victories? Panel is next. Hey, I want to bring. Welcome back. The panel is here. And when I say here, I mean here. Look, studio with us. First time in more than a year. And better yet, this is our new studio. It's the first time we've had anybody in this new studio. Washington Post White House Bureau Chief Ashley Parker, Democratic pollster Cornell Belcher, Republican strategist Brad Todd, and PBS NewsHour Chief Correspondent Amna Nawaz. By the way, both Brad and I, his middle name is no relation uh, <laughs> on that front. Uh, Ashley, when you read the tea leaves of Sanders and Portman, right, it looks close. This seems close. You're the White House Bureau Chief, okay? It's all about President Biden at this point. I think he wants this deal. Is he going to get it? He does want this deal, and especially when you talk to Republicans on the Hill, they think that he wants this deal even more than some of his staff. That's why in these moments where it starts yeah. to fall apart, you see these Republican senators, much to the chagrin of their staffs, unable to blame President Biden, right? They think he wants to get to yes, his staff is pulling him back. Um, I think we'll see. This is this is a different animal um, than the COVID rescue plan, which he just felt tremendous urgency to do. And he it's First, we should say he does define that as bipartisan, even though it got no yeah. Republican votes. Um, but he was just going to push this through. And when you talk to his team, this is something where they are proceeded to go it alone. But they do really want that bipartisan buy-in. And Amna, I, I think what we're all trying to figure out on the progressive side of things is how much patience do they have? And, and you know, is this about are they going to would they really kill a deal that President Biden endures? Yeah, and what you've seen from progressives early, I mean, to Ashley's point, I think this next bill is, is so different from previous ones coming back from that foreign trip. This is the real test now. Of how can President Biden move forward with that promise of bipartisanship, which he campaigned on, right? He said, I can do this. I have the relationships from my time in the Senate to pull this off. You saw progressives say, you know, those first 100 days were actually exceeded expectations with what we expected from this Biden administration. Now there's starting to be some fraying around the edges there, and you're seeing much more of that consternation and frustration growing. This is kind of an issue of just competing ambitions for Biden, though, right? Because he wants to be this president who comes out with the big, bold plans to move America through this time uh, of great turmoil and uncertainty and coming off a global pandemic. At the same time, he has to get things done. So he's at some point going to have to make a choice. Cornell and Brad, let's let's do this sort of the political calculations. Cornell, first, first to you. Um, do Democrats need to does Biden need to, to have a small bipartisan deal to 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 succeed? Or does he need something big with Democrats, but risk it maybe not happening for an entire calendar year? The answer is either, yeah. right? Uh, I think you, you take either and then, and then you sell it. Look, the Americans are always talking about they want bipartisanship. They want bipartisanship, bipartisanship. You hear it all the time. We also know there's a legislative grim reaper by the name of Mitch McConnell, who is 100 percent against uh, the, Bi the Biden agenda. So any ideal that, that you look, and Mitt Romney says, like, Give it, let's be open to the conversation. Manchin is saying, we know, you know, praising Senator, uh, the Senate leader for, for giving bipartisanship a chance. I think the optics of it, look, sausage making is ugly, but the yeah. optics of it, right, they're giving bipartisanship a chance. They're, they're trying. And in the end, if they do get a bipartisan bill, I think it'd be quite frankly politically good for both sides because infrastructure is something that Republicans and Democrats and independents all want. You know, Brad, I, I had a Republican uh, uh, staffer admit that the fact that the Republican base is more worried about critical race theory gives them room to do this deal. That there isn't the same. If you think about what happened during Obamacare, the whole world 
of the Republican base. Republicans, Republicans can support an infrastructure deal if it's concrete, water, and fiber. Uh, broadband, broadband roads, and, and it, but it can't be a Trojan horse for Bernie Sanders' wildest fantasies. And so you have to have a deal that Bernie Sanders will vote against to get a significant number of Republicans. And I think that's what the White House has to decide. Is it willing to lose 15 Democrats mm -hmm. in order to get a deal that includes 20 Republicans? Well, let me ask you this. If, 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 what's, I had somebody say, what's, if you don't like the $6 trillion deal, is it better to pass something or let the Democrats go it alone? I think it's incredibly risky for Democrats to run everything for two years on party line votes. That's a recipe for Republicans to take both chambers of Congress. And uh, I think the, the fact that you hear so many progressives act as if Democrats have 70 senators and not 50 mm -hmm. tells you exactly the, the tug that this White House is going to feel. Think that, that, I don't think that if there's a bipartisanship bill, the progressives are going to kill it. Progressives are not going to die. Sanders didn't sound like he was going to kill it. No, he goes, he's not going to. He kill talked that about what he liked. Right, and that's politics. You're supposed yeah. to say, you know, you know, I want this, I want this, and you hold out until until you try and try to get it. So I don't think I don't think that the progressives are going to going to kill this bill. But I also think at the same time it's going to be hard for Republicans to run in the, in the next fall midterm election with the idea that we tried to block everything that uh, that Biden tried to do. And I would also add, I think bipartisanship is incredibly important. As you said, Democrats don't want to do everything, go it alone. But if you talk to some of the Biden people results are equally as important. And you hear them often say they learned the lessons of the Obama years. And they point to the 2009 uh, bailout package and say, who remembers the three Republicans who voted for it and made it by? <laughs> you maybe remember, Chuck, but nobody else does. And they look at the COVID relief bill and they say there were no Republican votes, but it was checks in pocket, shots in arms, and that's what matters. So that is always in the back of their minds when they're deciding what to do. Can we also say that we saw some movement on Mitch McConnell? I'm not sure this counts or not, but to say bipartisanship <laughs> is dead after the talks between Shelley more capito and president biden broke down and then to come back a few days later and say 50 50 chance like maybe that's probably hey, let me ask a real cynical <laughs> question for both cornell and brad had stacy abrams attacked mansion's compromise <laughs> Does Mitch McConnell more open to it? Cornell, Brad. You, you should have went to Brad first. <laughs> <one. laughs> Sorry, Brad. I mean, Woody. I mean, I, I, I thought it was fascinating that because Stacey Abrams endorsed it, it was like, well, we can't I touch it now. I think that's the wrong question. I think Stacey Abrams endorsed it with the intent to kill it. Uh, she knows that she has to. Oh, wow. that, that that it has to die in order for her to get what she wants with S one with her Democrats know, I, I, and a party I'm, line. I'm vote. cynical. I'm not. I'm not that cynical. I think. I think. I think she. She is a good face. Is that because quite frankly, most of the things in that bill are common sense. And you talked about it. So these these are hard things for Republicans to reject, like redistricting. And the senator went on and talked about you know, this takes away the rights of of of, of Ohioans. No, even 57 percent of Republicans want uh, want non want sort of redistricting to be taken away from this this partisan games that we play. And look, you and I make our, our livings from 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 this. The gerrymandering has to stop. We're not even having fair federal elections anymore because incumbents keep winning because we keep gerrymandering their districts. Hey, Amna, do you want to circle the Bernie Sanders non-answer on Stephen Breyer? He wanted no part of that. <laughs> that was uh, a short and direct, <laughs> said a lot, succinct answer. Yes, yeah, it did. said a lot without saying a lot. That, that, that's that's what I thought too. All right, God. It was weird. Conversation, exchanges. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Anyway, as we go to break, I want to remind you all, by the way, that this season's episodes of Meet the Press Reports are available anytime on Peacock. Binge away. Check out our recent shows on extremism, athlete activism, millennial politics, much more. And our final episode is a really good one. Uh, it looks at whether the U.S. military is ready for the next war, which could start either in space or cyber. Up next, there were celebrations across the country yesterday marking Juneteenth. It's now a federal holiday. When we come back, how the belated recognition of Juneteenth may tell us as much about our future as it does about our past. We are back. It's data download time, and this time we are marking a new federal holiday. It's the first time a federal holiday has been added to the calendar in over 35 years. But before Juneteenth was a federal holiday, it was a state holiday almost everywhere. But that didn't happen overnight. Let me show you the journey of Juneteenth in the states. It began, of course, in Texas in 1980. Of course, Texas was uh, the first state to acknowledge Juneteenth, which, of course, is their acknowledgement that they were the last state essentially to acknowledge emancipation. And then by 1999, three other states were added, Minnesota, Oklahoma, and Florida. It was really in the first decade of this century that momentum for Juneteenth really took off. 30 plus states added it from 2000 to 2009. And in fact, by the time Congress voted on it, Every state but two had Juneteenth as a state holiday. Just South Dakota and Hawaii uh, didn't have it as a state holiday. North Dakota was the la uh, most recent state to add it in April. What's interesting here is just sort of 
where public opinion has been on this. Overall, just 35% of adults say that Juneteenth should be a federal holiday. But don't mistake that for a lack of support. It's more of a lack of knowledge about it because 40% said they didn't know. In public opinion, that tells you there is a bit of a knowledge gap on the issue overall. What's interesting on this knowledge gap is how much it is by age, a real generational divide. As you can see here, among younger folks, a majority believed Juneteenth should have been a federal holiday. Older folks got the less they thought Juneteenth should do that. And this plays out in other issues involving racial justice, for instance, reparations, the idea that descendants of slaves um, should be compensated. Well, support for it, there's still a majority that do not support reparations, but check out this generational divide. 42% among 18 to 34 believe uh, that yes, there should be some reparations. And as you will see, the older the respondent gets, the less support there is for it. But what does this tell you? Juneteenth is not the end of something when it comes to marking racial inequality in this country. It may be the beginning of a new conversation because as this younger generation gets older, the discussion of, of, of racial justice and equality is only going to become more central. So keep an eye on that. When we come back, Mike Pence gets heckled at a Christian conservative conference. Deeply humbled by just another sign that on the right these days, if you're not 100% with Donald Trump, you are considered 100% his enemy. Stick with us. Welcome back. Well, we saw what happened to Mike Pence uh, and this whole idea. Do you, how do you cater to the Trump base? Well, let me show you some examples of some potential once and future presidential candidates or Senate candidates or gubernatorial candidates and what they're doing to cater to the Trump base. Take a look. We felt very strongly that our tax dollars should not be going uh, to teaching these theories that are not based in fact uh, and that really divide people and is effectively a form of state-sanctioned racism. I am right here on the ground in Arizona, Maricopa County, at the election audit. The federal government has a legal responsibility under the federal immigration laws to do it, but because they are not doing it. Texas taxpayers are having to step up. And I, let me include Ohio Senate candidate Josh Mandel. Um, there are no words to this one. I think the image speaks for itself. And the burning of the mass there. You know, Brad, we were talking earlier, I said some Republican Senate staffers were sort of admitting, hey, the, the base isn't focused on infrastructure and what's going on in Capitol Hill, so there's some room to maneuver. But is the best way to win a Minnesota Senate primary is to go to Arizona for this audit? Like, what, what is this political theater about? Well, we, for about 12 years, being outside rather than inside has been far more important in Republican primaries than the ideological scale of right to left. And so you cannot be nominated in a Republican primary unless you can first prove you're going to be a disruptor. Uh, there are a lot of shorthand ways to do that. And I think that's really what you're seeing in, in many ways, because Republicans now, by and large, are agreeing on a lot of policy issues, especially when you're in the minority, that tends to happen. So therefore, proof, proof of how you're going to be a disruptor and how you're going to be someone who's going to advance a muscular pushback to the left is the first step to check. Is not having, though, a unified sort of, you say it's sort of, they're, they're, what are the issues that the party stands for, right? That seems to be the missing piece here, um. Yeah, and specific to this idea of critical race theory, I have to tell you, I just spent some time reporting on this county in Virginia about an hour outside of Washington. And, and to your point, this is something that is mobilizing people sure and is. resonating very deeply. It was about a 100 degree day, dozens and dozens and dozens of parents, mostly white in this largely affluent mm -hmm. county, showed up to a school board meeting. For many of them, the very first school board meeting they'd ever attended, specifically because of this one issue. That's important to note. It, it, that. You mentioned critical race theory a couple times. This is a parent-led backlash at the grassroots level. It's, and a bit, it's manufactured, no, it's, and, the it's completely, and, then, it, and then sort of the elected seems to have been lit. The up. fire was lit. I, I disagree. Yeah. I think it started because p parents have had it with the education bureaucracy after COVID. Mm -hmm. They're fed up with it. They tend to trust Democrats when it comes to education funding, but they trust Republicans on education accountability. I think that what the backlash you're seeing on critical race theory in schools is another example of parents trying to hold educators accountable. It's coordinated. It's aggressive. It's intentional, right? This is this is part of the the, the tribalism play. The critical race theory is is yet another tool in the in the in the racial tribal boogeyman's toolbox to drive and inflame tribalism, which Republicans think 
thinks helps them in, in, in elections. This is this is this is Trump 2.0. This is a this is, is a continuation of this, right? Critical race theory is is an arcane sort of ideal. Why is it front and center right now? The same reason that Mitch McConnell attacked Stacey Abrams when she came out for the for the vote for the voting bill. It is racial. It is tribalism. We've seen it grow under Trump, and this is part and partial of it. And they think this helps ignite their base. There's no way this is not grassroots. And Brad, you know this is organized and is being paid for. But, you know, Ashley, we're not very good at organizing or anything on our side. Like, <laughs> you it, it, all it, are it, better it, than <laughs> us. <laughs> you know, in 2018, Trump went culture with, with the caravans, right? It's sort of, and some would argue that it, there's some similar motivations with it. Democrats went substance with health care, uh, and they won the midterms. And certainly some, some rural states uh, on the Senate side, uh, you could argue, responded to the immigration message. But is there a risk here that Republicans are too focused on their culture war that they may turn off swing voters? That's definitely possible, but the problem is you have Republicans right now, um, as they were for the past four years, who are just terrified of Donald Trump and him coming out against them. It's unclear how much Donald Trump can affirmatively help, say, a House member get elected, but can he absolutely torpedo them in a Republican primary by showing up and doing a Friday night rally in their state or their home district? Absolutely. And so when you talk about the substance, you know, a, a picture of them, you know, paying homage to him at Mar-a-Lago going viral can be well, just as valuable as a, a plan to reduce the national debt. Hey, Brad, is it bad that uh, Ron DeSantis beat Donald Trump in a straw poll? Is that when I, I, I've been waiting? Is, is, is he going to do you want to be the first person to look like you're beating Trump? Uh, I don't know that uh, Ron DeSantis is going to be calling on Mar-a-Lago in the next few days until the next straw poll comes around, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. Uh, but that was interesting. I think you're talking about the Western yeah, states, the straw yeah. poll. You know, straw polls basically are great fodder for all of us in our, in our, in our business. And I don't know they you really know who mean cares much about straw polls. Donald Trump cares about <laughs> straw polls. I, he, he cares about fan polls. He cares about a lot of polls, not the accurate ones, but he does care about them. Hey, guys. It's great to have you in the building. It's good to be I back. appreciate it. Uh, before we go, you know we love documentary film. And we are once again partnering with our friends at the American Film Institute to sponsor the annual AFI Docs Film Festival. They've got 75 new films this year. You can watch them starting this Tuesday, June 22nd through June 27th. Tickets are on sale now at docs.afi.com. So go check it out. That's all we have for today. Thank you for watching. Enjoy your Father's Day, whether you're a dad or you're with your dad. And we'll be back next week because if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press.